Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Accessible Games interview series. I'm your host, Aaron Spelker. Mobile Accessible Games is a group that's dedicated about all things about mobile accessible gaming. And through our interview series, we interview game developers and accessibility influencers, as well as accessibility advocates. And this week, we have the creator of a real-time strategy text adventure, pretty well known in the community, called Timecrest. His name is Justin Ng. And Justin, welcome to the interview series. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, I've been watching a few of your excellent interviews on the channel. I think this series is an incredible resource for every game developer. I, I definitely will be telling um, everyone I know about it. Oh, excellent. We well, are always looking for people to interview, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so Justin, I always like to start off the interview with um, giving you a chance to just you know, give a little brief bio about yourself, you know, who you are, and um, you know, share that with the community. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Justin. I've been building uh, mobile games for over a decade. Um, I've been an engineering leader at companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, a mobile gaming company called Storm 8. And after those experiences, um, I co-founded the company Sneaky Crab uh, with my partner, Lisa Gu, and we developed Time Crest together. Uh, it's been an incredible journey over the last eight years to tell the story of Time Crest. Um, we've built an incredible audience of both sighted and blind people, of which uh, many, of, uh, many of them have stuck with us since the beginning. Uh, we've released three editions of Time Crest, and Lisa and I even got married in the end. So, oh, to say yeah, this has been a journey. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a profound journey, uh, and and you know it's been incredible you, sharing it with the community. You definitely had the long play there, huh? Let's <laughs> yeah, let's start a company yeah. together, and we'll spend all our time together. Nicely done. Yeah, it turns out that uh, when you are sort of figuring everything out together you start to learn how compatible you are. I mean, I, I think if you can make good business decisions together, you can also make good life decisions together. So it's worked out really well for us. Oh, congratulations. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so you know, we're here when we're talking about the game Timecrest and mm -hmm. uh, the world of Valencia that Timecrest uh, revolves around. So why don't you, you know, tell people, give kind of a, you know, that elevator pitch, if you will, of what is Timecrest? <laughs> what, what are you doing when you're playing this game? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, what I like to say is that Time Crest is a young adult uh, fantasy where you are the main character in the story. So there's this young mage named Ash who contacts you frantically through a pocket watch that connects to your iPhone, asking for your help. Um, Ash's world, called Alencia, it's about to be destroyed by falling meteors. And to both of your surprise, you demonstrate the ability to save Ash's world by being able to turn back time. So... That's really cool, but there isn't really too much time to celebrate because Ash is suddenly being hunted by someone who informs you that you've done the impossible. Your use of time magic has broken the rules of magic. We don't know what choices you'll make or whether you'll choose to save the world or something else, but you know, uh, as the developers of this game, we're excited to see what choices people make and what people choose to do. Um, the only thing that we do know is that your journey will take you through wondrous places where you'll meet people that either become your friends or enemies based on the choices you make. Uh, but uh, I think after all these years and all the feedback from anyone, I think the choice to experience this game is uh, a journey of a lifetime. Yeah, and, and as you're kind of communicating with Ash, uh, you're really, like, he's kind of reaching out to you for advice. You know, uh, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Do I go to the library and, and talk to the librarian <laughs> or do I, you know, go down to, you know, whatever, the port and talk to the fisherman? Like, so you're giving him some advice and <laughs> depending on, that advice or suggestion or answer to you know how he should handle something, you know it starts you know, developing the story. So you're you're kind of like the uh, his guide, if you will. Or he, well, I guess Ash is technically you don't really know if Ash is a. I guess you could answer this question: Is Ash a female or a male? Because it's kind of not openly <laughs> mentioned. Yeah, and actually, uh, we don't openly mention if Ash is a male or female because it was important for us that Ash is whatever you imagine Ash to be, because. Uh, one of the fundamental things in this game is your connection to Ash, your connection to this character. We want Ash to be someone that you feel close to, that you're texting with, and you eventually grow to, to feel like you can be open with and Ash can be open with you. And so whatever character you imagine in your mind, however um, you think that they are, um, we want you to be able to imagine that. If you think Ash is a boy, if you think Ash is a girl, if you think Ash is something else, if you think Ash is a space alien looking thing, that's up to you really. Um, but uh, you know, this thing about 
about connection is why it's not just, I think you're very right to say that, yeah, you can advise Ash, like, let's go explore the library, let's go here. But I think also more importantly, um, you have conversations with Ash and sometimes Ash will feel happy or sad based on the things you say. And mm -hmm. it was important to us that even five chapters later, Ash might remember that thing you said and, and, and respond to it or take a different action or think differently. And so it was important to us that not only the big choices of do this, do this um, are interesting, but also how do people feel about what you're saying and how you're saying it to them? Yeah, and now, I mean, particularly, you know, that branching narrative and uh, you know, consequences for different actions, that mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. spin out of control pretty quickly. And now we're talking yes. you know, eight, eight to 10 years of, you know, decisions <laughs> being made and, you know, relationships being built. I mean, how are you keeping track of all that and being sure that you don't, you know, one, paint yourself into a corner or paint you <laughs> yourself into something that never actually gets used or resolved? Uh, you know, how do you, how are you keeping it all straight so that it all, it's, you know, a, a sound experience, if you will? That's a really good question, and and I ask ourselves that we ask ourselves that sometime. But uh, um, yeah, but let me let's let me go into this a little bit. I mean, I think that we started out with a pretty modest story. Uh, I have to admit that the original version of Tom Crest One was we kind of just did some discovery writing. We came up with some cool characters and plot ideas, and just got them down and and tried to see where those would go. But I think as we invested more and more time into the story in this world in this game, we started to realize where everything was going. We had all of these cool little emotional beats and, and plot surprises um, that we wanted to get to. Um, and as we added new content, we found that uh, we could focus on sort of great scenes to build up those key moments, right? Like, uh, um, I think that that's one of the secrets we've discovered to good storytelling is that when you're experiencing a story, people remember the big twist, the big emotional moment. They think, oh, well, I can't wait till I, I check out the next movie, the next story with a big twist, right? But we've learned that actually the reason that those moments feel so good are the moments of build up, the moments, the, all of the scenes that give you reasons why the thing that's about to happen matters, right? right? And even though you don't sort of remember those scenes, we spend a lot of time on those scenes to try to make those big uh, moments feel good. Um, and uh, uh, I think we've also created, we've come up with a bunch of rules for ourselves. You know, there are other um, sort of games in the genre where you can make choices and communicate with a character, but um, I think we've come up with a few things that we hold ourselves to that make it very difficult to write the story, but I think make the experience of Time Crest a, a, a lot better. Um, so, for example, um, one of the things we try to hold by is that there should be no wrong choices, just sort mm -hmm. of alternate stories and paths to explore. Each should have a satisfying plot arc. Um, we didn't like how a lot of stories in the genre have straight up bad or wrong choices that make you feel like, oh, I, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I wish I could go back, right? Um, and instead we wanted to be even the most frivolous seeming choices. I think I think in Time Crest 3, there's a choice that is like, uh, we call it the, ah, we're doomed choice, where it sounds like, why would you ever pick this thing where you just tell the character, oh, we're doomed, right? And yet, you know, uh, one of the secrets is that this actually leads to a long path with consequences and an interesting different story. Um, this rule means that there are entire paths that sometimes take us months to write that some people ne may never see unless they play through right. again and again, but it feels really good because you never have to have that feeling of, oh no, I, I, I made the wrong thing, I, I need to start over. Um, and then the second rule that we made for ourselves is that um, we, wouldn't, we, we want to have choices as much as possible. I mean, that might be what's on the player's mind, what you might be thinking at the time, the thing you feel like you want to say, because um, it's really difficult from a writing perspective, because that means the player wants to give that piece of information that's kind of inconvenient at that moment, right? Like that, uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever been watching a movie and you, you just say like, oh, hey, main character, do this. Yeah. You should just know this, right? Like right. all our problems we solved, you just knew this one thing, right? And and uh, the writers always pull all sorts of tricks to try to make sure certain characters don't know certain things at certain points in time. We tried to make it feel like, okay, you're the main character. And if you're an actual character in this, you would say this if you were here. And so as hard as it is for us to write what will happen next, we try as much as possible to make that happen. And sometimes that means adding choices like, being nice to the character or being mean to the character, right? Because like, you know, maybe me personally, I would like to be nice to the main character, but, or sorry, nice to Ash or some of the other characters, but um, but maybe someone else 
feels like they want to be a bit snippy at this moment. Right. Um, and so, so we wanted to have that. And so, you know, I'll sort of tie that all up saying uh, the answer is that Lisa is kind of the one who focuses mostly on the story and the creative part. And uh, this whole process has been giving her countless trips to the jar of Advil. Uh, the paths grow <laughs> exponentially yeah. and uh, she works really, really hard. And somehow to this point, she's managed to keep it all in her head. Um, as far as I know, we don't have any major, major plot holes. So um, all I can say is if we knew how hard this would have been, we wouldn't have started it in the beginning, but I'm glad that we, we got this far. So, you know, it sounds like things have changed over time. So, so you had mm -hmm. a point mm -hmm. where you wrote, as you said, kind of that original story, um, but it sounds like that story that has been, you know, over time fleshed out even more with some more beats, with some more choices and expanded, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. how do you manage that? If I'm playing your original time crest, right? And I'm mm -hmm. halfway through mm -hmm. the game and now you're yeah. like, oh, we've added all sorts of different choices and, you know, updates. What happens to me who's in actually in the middle of the game and I've already made some choices, mm -hmm. you know, do, does that kind of ruin my game or do like you just make some choices for me that, that would have been up to that point? Like, how do you deal with people who are, you know, maybe partway through the game when you do a push of an update or a new storyline or a new choice? That's a great question. Um, we uh, thought about what would happen uh, with any update a lot. So, you know, if we're just sort of adding new content to the end, then that's pretty simple. You know, if there's something that's going to happen in the future of your game, you know, uh, we I said we have Time Crest 1, Time Crest 2 and 3 are updates to the same app, right? So Time Crest 1 is chapters 1 through 5, Time Crest 2 is chapters 6 through 10, Ch Time Crest 3 is chapters 11 through 15. So if you're on chapter 3, adding content to chapter 15 isn't going to affect you too much. Sure. Now that said, we have done some rewrites to Time Crest. We uh, earlier this year did a major update where we actually rewrote and added um, a lot of choices and changed a lot of scenes. We added, I think, something like 120,000 words uh, to Time Crest 1 and a little bit of Time Crest 2, right? We actually thought very deeply of how that would affect you. Um, and um, I think that the decision that we made was that if you happen to be in the middle of a game of Time Crest 1, that old version is still there. So you still can continue to play through. And then you know, we made sure that all of the changes to Time Crest 2 and beyond would flow seamlessly into that. So there are actually sort of historic paths that we created in Time Crest 2 that only work if you're playing the old version of Time Crest 1 that you don't even, you only have access to if you were in the middle of playing it when we released the update. Um, and for anyone new playing Time Crest 1, or if you wanted to experience it again, you can always start a new game and see the new content, right? Um, but that is a more extreme example. Uh, I think in general, usually we can just update around your existing things. Um, but either way, we want to make sure that um, all of these different players had a good experience. With all of the, um, you know, well, obviously kind of the, the real passage of time, you talk to Ash, he needs 15 minutes mm -hmm. to go over to the library and you got to wait and then he, he reaches back out to you and, and you talk. But mm -hmm. I said that, that was always originally in the game, but like some, some of the other, Time manip manipulation stuff, the, the memory sequence mm -hmm. stuff, was was mm -hmm. all of that always there, or did those come in, um, get developed over time and, and added to the game? Yeah, I think that um, uh, a lot of it was there at the beginning, and some of you know sometimes as we explore and, and figure out how this all works, uh, we've added a few things. So I, I think at its core, we wrote Time Crest to make everything feel as much as possible like it's happening in real time. If Ash is describing things to you, or uh, you know, when Ash closes their pocket watch, if you hit a timer, we try to make it feel like you're right in the middle of everyone's actions. That uh, uh, it's it's going to take Ash two minutes to do the thing, so you wait two minutes uh, before that happened. Um, there's this feature called a memory oracle where you can go back and see the pasts of some of the characters that you get to meet, and and you can unlock those and uh, um, kind of peer back through time and see you know what they went through. Um, your abilities to manipulate time is kind of a mechanic in this game. Um, and as you progress through the adventure, you'll find more answers of, as to how this works, right? But uh, um, uh, in the storyline, at least, only one person in Alincia truly knows the truth of your powers. So I guess you'll have to play the game and ask them how to understand truly how your uh, powers work. Um, so you know, it, it, it's there's been so much that's kind of gone into this game. 
Um, mm-hmm. it, it's just something, and and I guess you know, even to go back, I, I I get the sense that there was almost near uh, instant popularity with this game, and <laughs> it seems like it might have hit at a really good time with the Apple Watch coming out, and maybe there wasn't mm-hmm. too much on the Apple Watch. Plus, you got some coverage and maybe New York Time about you know mm-hmm. great, great mm-hmm. games to play. So, uh, has that vaulted you in a position where? You know, this is what you do full time for the last eight years, or do you do this uh, uh, as kind of a nights and weekend thing? Like, how much is time crest um, uh, of kind of your career, if you will? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for mentioning how time crest worked out at the beginning, and we're very humbled by the response. It was a mix of hard work and I think a lot of luck. Uh, I mean, we tried to make time crest great and work hard to tell a story that didn't pull punches. In, in making you feel things for the plot and the characters, but hard work can easily be overlooked. And we were super lucky that Time Crest was noticed at launch. Uh, we, we launched with the release of the Apple Watch Store. The New York Times did a feature on Apple Watch apps to try at the time. Um, you know, we were featured in the Apple Store Best Of that year. Um, the, uh, the site Apple Biz awarded us uh, Best Developer and Best Game for their Golden Apples Accessibility Awards. Uh, and you know, you know, we were super humbled. You never know if um, the thing that you do, you, you quit your jobs, you start a two-person indie game company, and and you try to see what's going to happen. And uh, and we're super lucky um, that we've been able to get this far. Um, we're doing this full time, and uh, we are con- continually working on Time Crest and trying to bring new updates and new content. Um, Obviously accessibility is extremely important to us and we spend a lot of time with the community as well, getting feedback and um, improving the accessibility of the game. But yeah, this is what we're doing nights and weekends. It's, we're a small indie game company trying to get enough, uh, trying to bring out new updates and new features so that we have enough to not only pay our own bills, but bring in new content. Uh, So uh, yeah, I, I appreciate everything, all of the support uh, up and down that has allowed us to do it this far. That's, that's great. I was um, so happy for people who are able to support themselves as a full time because there are so many people who put out great great content but just can't. You know, they didn't hit it at the right mm-hmm. spot. Mm-hmm. They don't get yes. the traction. Um, so do you treat that? You know, you wake up at nine or you know eight, go to work, and uh, you know work nine to five, uh, doing this uh, Monday through Friday. Is that how you kind of you know do you treat it really formal like that uh, as a job? Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd say that in general, this is what we're doing all the time. When we go to bed, we're thinking about what to do next. When we wake up in the morning, we're still thinking about what to do next, what story to, to write, what story to tell, what update to make, uh, what would something the community want the most. That said, I think we're trying to build more and more structure into our lives. I think that a structured life helps creativity, helps productivity, and so on. But uh, I think it's the uh, it's the entrepreneurship grind, I think, that... Uh, 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 um, when when you're on it on your own, when you're making a company like this, you're always wondering what tomorrow brings, and and nothing is always certain in the future. So I think it's uh, it's you know we continue to grind is is the best way I'll put it. So I'm I'm particularly interested on the business side. You know, feel free to mm-hmm. answer yeah. at, at whatever level of detail you're comfortable with. But yeah, um, so let's say you put out Time Press One, and Time Press mm-hmm. comes go and get some good you know feedback traction from the New York Times and, and the Apple Watch, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you probably get a bunch of downloads and you probably have a, a, a sum of money that comes in. And then I got to imagine it peters off um, mm-hmm. to some degree um, until you can get a time press two out. And then, you know, you get an in, in, you know, insertion of cash, you know, you know, as a bunch of people have been waiting for two to come out. So, like, how do you keep the money flow going and manage that so that, you know, you know, there's going to be a payoff because you, know, you could spend, I don't know how long it would take to, you know, you know to create Timecraft 3, um, but you got to hope that you put all this time in and that actually is going to pay off for you. Or is there mm-hmm. other ways that you're, you know, time press one and two is, you know, getting a steady stream of downloads that just seem to come in every month. And that's, you know, helping to keep you afloat until you can get the big push of you know, the ne- next big installment of chapters out. Like, how do you manage that? Because that just seems like there's so many people who, you know, might falter from that standpoint of just, you know, I just, I still have you know, monthly mortgage to pay and car payment and student loans and all these things mm-hmm. that this kind of variability of income is just too hard um, to really make a go of it like you've, you've managed to do over the last eight years. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a really good question. And, you know, I won't say that uh, I know everything about how to make this work, but I can sort of talk about our experience and uh, a little bit about what has worked for us um, to try, try to do this, right? I, I think that number one is that, um, yeah, it was tough, definitely, even during the beginning. I'll admit that uh, in the early days, um, uh, I, uh, I worked on this full time, and then I actually took a day job at Facebook for a couple of years, uh, and then eventually, you know, left that job and then continued to do this full time, right? I, I think it, it's difficult to get this going, especially at the beginning, um, uh, when you're trying to do this, uh, this, this, this whole thing alone and, you know, with a lot of, a lot of support. But that said, there are a few things that have worked well for us that I think has brought us to this point. Um, I think that number one is, I mean, everyone says this, so this, this may be too generic, but make a great product, right? I, what we have found is that um, Timecrest, especially someone who's experienced the game to the end of chapter 15 through the end of uh, Timecrest 3, um, in business terms, our retention is very high. Like when we look at the numbers of the people who do hang around, hang around for a long time. And there's a fan-made Discord server where we see daily conversations, and there are people who have been playing for eight years that, you know, we haven't, our, our updates aren't that frequent, to be honest. Sometimes it can take us a couple of years between updates, and people have stuck with us that whole time because they have um, fallen in love with the characters. They, they you know, we've thrown a lot of ideas that people will philosophize over. Was this person right? Or was that person right? Oh, have you explored this path? Have you done this thing? I think that we sort of separated our game from others by adding a lot of depth, having a lot to talk about that eight years later, people still feel like they have a lot to talk about. So I think number one is having something that can keep people coming back for a long period of time. And I'm proud that at least the community have proven that some people have stuck with us all this time. I think that the second thing is to know your customer well. And right now we have a tremendous number of low vision and blind people uh playing time crest which is incredible which which we love and uh you know i'll admit wasn't the original goal when we first developed time crest but as soon as we got community feedback and this and we heard hey we're blind and we like your game but it's not accessible enough we pivoted to say accessibility is our number one priority um and i think that focusing on accessibility has been one of the most uh, important things we did. And so, you know, if anyone's listening to this interview wondering, hey, should I make my game accessible? Should I invest a lot in it? It's worked for us. I think that if you focus on who your players are and what they need and what they want, um, there's going to be a lot of returns for that. There's um, another developer, again, that's kind of a text adventure, um, choose your mm -hmm. adventure type of game, a really rich world that he has built. And um, I know one of the ways that he sustains himself is he has a Patreon page where he mm, does, yes. uh, you know, monthly writings, you know, other stories in the world, if you will, that kind of come out on that. And he kind of puts that out and you know, people who are on the Patreon get that. And I think, you know, at the higher levels, you get you know, a chance to you know, get, get some input into, you know, future storylines and things like that. And then that, you know, allows him to have a steady stream that he, you know, mostly can count on to just sustain him between, it takes three or four years between um, these major story releases uh, to come out. So, so have you ever explored anything like that, like a Patreon um, to kind of create a, a steady revenue stream? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a great question. We don't have a Patreon at the time, um, but uh, was that was that Sabres of Infinity? I felt yes. like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I watched that one. That was a that was a great interview. Um, yeah, I think we've debated pretty much all the different ways to monetize our game. Patreon came up. I think all sorts of things have come up. Um, and we actually, this, I, I'd say monetization was one of the toughest debates we have internally. Uh, sounds so fancy when I say internally. Me and Lisa <laughs> debated uh, ad nauseum about this. And, and you know, our players continue to give us lots of feedback because, uh, of course, people care about uh, monetization, right? But um uh, we decided that we wanted to make this game complete, completely free to play. Um, and we have optional in-game purchases to accelerate gameplay. Um, and we made this choice because it was important for us to reach as many people as possible. That, that's something we really wanted to do. And so if 
if say the game was an upfront purchase for some amount of money, we felt like this would exclude those who weren't able to afford that, right? So we, we chose up both the business model and a way to design the content where you can actually experience every piece of content in the game without ever spending a dollar. Um, but you know, since we do want to pay our bills and most importantly, fund future updates and more games, especially more accessible games, by adding in-game purchases, those who want to support us and believe in what we're doing can directly do so, and they speed up their own progress on exchange. I mean, it's much like a Patreon model, um, but I guess we just did everything within the app itself. And does that keep, again, does that, you know, the month of September coming up, do you have a mm -hmm. good feel, and, you know, uh, does it, I roughly expect that we'll pull in, you know, whatever, $10 or $12 or, or, or you know, do you have, uh, yeah, I'm just making up numbers, but like, do you have a number in your <laughs> mind that, you know, based off of, you know, September last year and the last three months that, you know, this is kind of our expected run rate, you know, that, that we think would come in? Yeah, we have all, all of the usual things you would expect a small business to have to do, right? So we, we look at, uh, we definitely track um, how the games are doing, how the different updates are doing, and, you know, what we need to, to fund things in the future, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, let alone the incredible amount of time it takes to write a story like this. Sometimes it can take years to add uh, another addition to this. Just adding music, paying for music, paying for, you know, sound effects, adding all of those things that, you know, add so much to, to the story. Um, all, all, all costs, uh, our investment costs, right? So we are definitely, like any other business, sort of trying to balance the books and see, you know, what, what's going to happen. Now, this particular story is, is this, you know, when you left your, your jobs at Google or wherever you were at the time, um, did you already have this story in your head or did you guys like, all right, we want to do a story and you and, and Lisa, right, Lisa? Yes. Yeah. yeah and Lisa. You, you and Lisa, did you just start passing back and forth ideas uh, and, until you kind of <laughs> came up with a, a story like, or was this a story that was inside you itching to be told? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that you could kind of put it like this. Um, you know, at the time that we started Time Crest and Sneaky Crab, Lisa and I had been working in in mobile gaming uh, for quite some time. Um, I think pretty much when the the App Store on the iPhone came out, and it was around 2015. And I think we both kind of felt that mobile gaming was getting kind of stale, right? Uh, a lot of the games at the time were very simple mechanics and themes and they were doing really well, but uh, we felt like um, uh, uh, mobile games were the only medium that didn't have kind of deep emotional stakes and, and or narrative with stakes, right? So we wanted to do something in this space. Um, we both love fantasy and science fiction and we kind of had this massive blank page to work with. You know, we weren't copying anyone. We were just starting from scratch. So. Um, I guess Time Crest is where we 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 went, right? Like uh, we started out saying, okay, we wanted to, one of the first Apple Watch apps. So we th thought, okay, it would be kind of cool if your Apple Watch is a little bit like a communicator where you could communicate with a young mage. Uh, they have a pocket watch, you have an Apple Watch. Um, and then naturally the kind of magic in a magic world you think of when you're thinking about watches is time magic, right? And so uh, this time traveling fantasy story emerged um, and Lisa herself, she likes magic and time magic. So she felt this is the one story she had to write if we were going to write anything. Um, so background wise, uh, do you have like, you know, formal like uh, coding uh, education? Like, did you go to school for computer science? Did you go to school for writing? What, what did the two of you go to school for? You know, or maybe what did you exactly do when you were working at all those tech companies? Yeah, uh, I mean, sp speaking for myself, I uh, uh, yeah, I, I do have a degree in computer science, um, and uh, before doing this, I, I had been working in a lot of different uh, tech companies. Uh, uh, I have experience uh, both uh, coding uh, applications and games, um, and I think later on, I, I spent more time uh, doing management, uh, uh, engineering management, but I. Uh, definitely prefer building things with my own two hands and communicating directly with uh, with the community, right? These are two things that I love to do, which is, I think, why this is is uh, sort of a, a much, much bigger fit. But um, yeah, I, I have been a lot more on the technical side um, of things uh, at Stormate, which was a mobile gaming startup I had worked on 
for a while. I, I built game engines there. Uh, it was a fun challenge to figure out how to get the original iPhones to run an entire game. Uh, I mean, nowadays iPhones are more powerful than laptops, so it's it's a bit of an easier problem, yeah. but it was much harder than Lisa's uh, very strong on sort of the creative side, especially the creative management side. Uh, I mean, as Stormage, she was a game director um, and uh, she's been writing her whole life. Uh, so she's uh, she's definitely, uh, I mean, we both sort of do our, have our hands in all aspects of the development of, of Tom Crest. And, you know, I have a lot of input on stories. She has a, have a, a lot of input on the app development, but that said, you know, she's extremely strong in the creative. I would say she's the main writer of this game. I would give her all the credit to the writing. Um, and I spend a lot of time on the tech. What uh, software program are you using to, you know, actually create the application in the game? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Right now we're on iPhone and Apple Watch. Uh, we work on the iPad as well. So, you know, Apple kind of forces you down this path where everything is built in Swift and Xcode. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in addition to that, I think what's important to mention is that uh, um, a lot of narrative-based games like this um, use uh, tools like Twine, right? I think Twine is a really famous one. And uh, but when we started TimeCrest, we actually evaluated Twine and we evaluated a bunch of options like that. And they're excellent. They're really, really good. But uh, um, we felt like for how we wanted to tell the story, we wanted more control. So for TimeCrest, we actually developed what I would almost call like a story programming language, right? Where you can change individual words or lines or subsections of an, a line in a story, and you can decide those changes based on all sorts of different factors of what has happened previously um, in the story. And so this allows us complex changes to happen in a single scene, uh, such as like, is this character alive? Do you have a certain amount of relationship built up with this other character, but you also set this mean thing to them? Um, we might write the same line of text 12 different ways, uh, depending on what has happened in the past. It was important to us that like, you know, a, something that happens in chapter two could change something that happens in chapter 13. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we felt like the tools were excellent, but not couldn't quite do some of the things we wanted to do with them. So that's why we, we went super custom. Is it um, like I ever thought of, um, you know, packaging that, uh, you know, the program that you built for others to do these types of games? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we actually have been so focused on developing new content that we haven't put a lot of thought to that. But like, if there is interest, if if there's if there's anyone uh, if there's anyone watching this who is interested in making a game like Timecrest and is interested in 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 uh, how we build things, I, I think that's always on the table. I think we're always open to conversations because uh, uh, we would love more more stories and more creativity and more ideas uh, with this type of a game. You know, over this kind of sprawling time period, has there been you know kind of any interaction with the community that has led you down paths of the story that you you know, you're like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's like, let's go explore that, and you've gone off in, in a direction that you know wasn't originally planned for. But you know, with that community that you've built, has kind of led you down into you know different areas. Um, yeah, I think. Let me think about this. It's 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 hard to. I we spend a lot of time talking to the community, listening to feedback, asking specific questions, and. Um, I think in particular that has led to a lot of changes to the features and the UI flows and the improvement of accessibility. And it, I think in terms of the story, the one thing to mention is just that, um, you know, Lisa was getting a lot of questions about what it would be like to be blind in Alencia. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely took notice of that. And uh, I think that it's, you know, both of us are sighted. And so I think that no matter what we do, it's very hard to feel competent to write the perspective of a blind character, right? Mm -hmm. But that said, I think based on all of the questions, Lisa felt like it was something that she had to address because it's something that people wanted to know, right? And as much as possible, we, we, we wanted to address that. So I think she spent a lot of time trying to uh, uh, under, understand the the blind perspective. She actually tried living her life blindfolded for a while. I I I I mean I don't I don't know how people feel about that. Like I think as much as possible, we try to build up empathy for the situation, right? And uh, I think at the end of the day, 
um, she did write um, a character. I think it's a little bit of a spoiler to be specific who it is, but there is a character in the story who is blind. And I think that uh, um, this character generally has been um, um, accepted, accepted pretty well um, uh, when this character uh, was introduced in, in Time Press 3. Um, and I think that the important thing that Lisa kind of landed on as the principle is um, being blind did not define this character, but it was a reality of this character, but it also didn't define this character, right? Mm -hmm. That this character was just a human being. And so you'll see this character um, is sometimes heroic and sometimes is flawed and, and makes the decision that you're just screaming at and why are you doing this, right? Because we wanted this to be a, a full flawed human being that uh, ha happened to be blind and this was an important part of them. You know, we didn't like stories where being blind defined this person or that they had so many abilities and powers that they essentially weren't blind. Um, and then I think the nice thing is world building wise, it also got to explore a little bit about what blind life could be like, what someone living that life would be, uh, how it would be in, in Alencia. With um, with the accessibility um, and adding it in, what what was the toughest part to make accessible with the game, or did it go pretty smoothly adding accessibility to time press? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and you know I'll come back first and foremost to the point that the biggest difficulty is that we're sighted, and so you know from a design standpoint, it's hard to know from personal experience where the major pain points are, and as much as you listen to feedback from the community. Um, it never replaces direct experience, right? So I think it is very important that when we decided we wanted to make TimeCrest accessible, um, we made a decision, hey, we're gonna use our phones with screen curtain on using only voiceover accessibility features for the next six weeks. And uh, it was important that we built empathy in ourselves for what the experience is like using um, uh, accessibility features and feel the pain points ourselves. But even with that, that, that'll that never change the fact that we are cited. And I think that accepting that is the first step to removing the roadblocks to accessibility. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, I, the, the, yeah, the developers ahead. I've talked to who have been you know pretty successful in creating a, a pretty accessible game that's been pretty smooth are the ones that have done exactly what you said, which is I turned on screen curtain or I blindfolded myself and I you know, played the game until I reached the end so that I knew it was possible and I knew where the hiccups were and I knew where the problems were. So, because if you just kind of like, oh, I'll just make this accessible, but never actually test it yourself, you don't, you don't realize like, well, yes, but you can get there, but you have to swipe a hundred times to get to the thing that I want you to press. And that, that doesn't make sense. So let me think of a better way to build this or a feature, you know, add headers or something, you know, that allows the a blind person to get there a little bit quicker. Um, so the ones that I, I have found that have been successful did exactly what you did, which is blindfold themselves, put on screen curtain, use it exclusively for a long period of time so they you know, really get used to uh, how it operates. So that, that was, seems to be the best way to do it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I highly recommend it because, you know, it brings a different level of if you don't do that and you just sort of try to follow, you know, Apple has all sorts of videos and support on how to build accessible apps. And if you just sort of follow those things to the letter, you put a lot of labels into things and you try it out, you jump into voiceover and you kind of say, okay, like it seems to be a label, it seems to work, but you don't get to really understand where it's painful to use your app, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for me, as I use Timecrest, you know, actually, like the funny thing is that my experience with Screen Curtain caused me as an app designer to want to break Apple's rules a lot. Like, I think Apple kind of has this uh, um, guideline around, like, don't change UI with voiceover on. Make it exactly the same and just label it as if there's this utopia that, you know, the assistive technology is so good that any app you design is, is going to be accessible if you put the right labels on it. And we found that not to be true. Um, and so there's actually all, all sorts of things that change uh, when voiceover is on in Timecrest. You know, for example, there's added sound effects that we put subtly in the background that let you know, um, oh, a, mess a new message has come in. 
uh, uh, through the pocket watch, right? Or all the messages have completed sending. And instead of some voice announcing it, which would be annoying, it's just a subtle sound effect that you all, as you get used to them, you can subconsciously know, oh, it's ready for me. I can do the next thing. I can swipe to the next option. And these don't exist with voiceover off. And those directly came from the fact that we found it was annoying that we couldn't figure out when these things were happening and we needed some way to indicate it. Um, to the person playing, right? And little features like this, you only get if you if you actually take the time to turn on screen curtain and see like how how is this app experienced? Live with it for a little while. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so you know, we, we were talking a little bit before about the, you know, the revenue stream, if you will. But I mean, beyond revenue stream, like how are you mm -hmm. gauging the success of? you know, the apps that you're putting out or the games that you're putting out, right? How do you, how do you measure that, you know, this worked out the way I wanted it to, I mean, this has been successful, or, you know, beyond obviously the downloads of, or, or money made. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, there's a few things that I would think about to measure success. I, I think first and foremost, the most important thing is, are we proud of the story? Is this the kind of story that we want to read and experience for ourselves? Um, because if you don't believe in it, then I don't think anyone's going to believe in it. And, and I think it's why people have stuck with Time Press for so long is, uh, is, is that. I think secondly, you know, are people playing and, and loving Time Crest? Um, feedback is the single most important gauge of if we're doing well here. Um, we spend a lot of time with the community. We talk to people online, uh, on Discord, on Twitter, wherever they are, you know, we have discussions. And then finally, I think the most uh, it caps off by saying, are we able to fund more projects and bring more accessible games to the market? If anything, we just need each update in each game to fund the next one. And if we can do that for a long time, we're going to be really happy. So, you know, what, where are we in the, the cycle right now? So, I mean, time press three is on. Right? So, where are we on getting towards you know, updating one, two, or three, or putting, getting out time press four? Like, where are we in that cycle? Like, what could people expect next? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, as I said earlier, we're just off the release of a major rewrite to Time Crest. We launched that back in April. We added a ton of new content. Um, we're super proud of it and, and hope people check it out. Um, you know, the response was really incredible. And uh, months later, uh, what are we in August right now? People are still finding new content, new paths to the story, even though so many of them have been working through it. Um, we haven't made any announcements yet for what's next because we just kind of are off this release, which I hope everyone checks out. So, you know, I apologize for being a little bit cagey, but all I can say is that we're hard at work on new content, um, stuff that I'm confident people will greatly enjoy when it comes. Um, and all I can say is I hope everyone continues to support us, not only us, but um, any accessible apps or games that you like. I hope you support those developers, play those games, um, tell everyone you know about them. You know, I, I uh, people ask me, oh, like, what can I do to make sure Time Press 4 comes out? What can I make sure, what can I do to make sure new great content comes out? And I'd say not just for us, all the developers that you care about, that care about accessibility, um, do everything you can to let everyone know about them, spend money in their games, um, play their games, uh, bring more people, sighted, non-sighted people into them, I've worked at big companies and sometimes people ask me like, how, how, why do they not take accessibility as something more important? Um, shouldn't they spend, shouldn't they do that more? And, and all I can say is that their thought process is very simple. They look at our other products out there that are successful, that have these kinds of things in them. And I can confidently say that the community support is the most powerful thing we have. And if they continue to do what you're doing with these interviews, bringing so much to all of this, uh, what developers are doing and supporting those people who do it. The bigger companies will all take and see all these successes, these success cases. Um, and it's very easy for them to use those examples to fund more and more and more, right? So uh, that's, you know, hopefully I can leave everyone with that thought of continuing to support these developers. I, I feel very passionate about this. You, uh, you mentioned that, uh... You have like a Discord. How do how do people find that Discord, or you know, or maybe you can share me the link to that so that I can put it in the notes here so that people can get to it. And and is that just open discussion? Just people telling their theories of what they think is going to happen in four, and or getting help? You know, hey, I'm stuck. Uh, what should I do? Like is that 
that's what's kind of covered in the Discord? Absolutely. I'll send you the link. So, you you know, if people are interested, hopefully you can direct them that way. Uh, it's a, a it's actually an excellent fan made discord. Uh, it's it's again, what uh, incredible what the community has done. Um, you can also probably find it if you search for Time Crest on Twitter. We link to that fan made discord a lot. And the incredible thing about it is there's continual discussions happening about Time Crest. In fact, uh, they have all sorts of events. They recently had a big sort of voice call trivia event for Time Crest. And uh, a year or two ago, they actually put out a fan magazine. And what was incredible is not only was it a fan magazine with like incredible fan art and pictures and stories and so on, but they actually created an accessible text based version where they even described all of the images in it. And Ooh. this was this this was so nice because, you know, um, just by example, our community is trying to create accessible content, which That's is true. not something we asked for, but are so proud that they did. So anyway, please. Uh, check that out. Um, I, I think the community is incredible and I love talking to them every day. From a standpoint of, of story, um, mm -hmm. like I, I know with like books, they always say like, it's really kind of like your fourth book that you start building an audience because over the course of four books, if you cover you know four different kind of topics, you, someone gets interested in book number two and then they decide to read book one, three and four or someone likes book four and then goes mm -hmm. back to one, two and three. Um, so like that's how you build an audience and you don't really get to really build that audience until uh, before. Like, have you ever thought of, well, we'll keep time cast going, but we're going to also build a, uh, you know, cyberpunk uh, storyline as well that, that we also work on uh, and, you know, kind of release you know, back and forth between those two. Have you ever thought of, you know, and, uh, and kind of expanding out into a completely different storyline beyond time cast? Um, we're, Considering all sorts of things, again, I'm going to be a little bit cagey with my answer, but <laughs> we, I mean, we've been working on Time Crest for eight years, so we have all sorts of ideas, uh, things, stories we want to tell, um, things we want to write about. I mean, we know Time Crest 4 is really important to people. People want to know what happens next, um, and so we also know that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the other thing that I'll just say is we also see this as a, a universe of stories, right, that... Uh, um, you know, Alencia is just one world in, in a big universe. And I think within that universe, there are also a lot of stories to tell that, you know, are different places or different genres or different themes, but like are tied together by being in the same universe, right? right. Um, so, you know, again, I'm not going to be specific on what's next or, or what we're doing, but just know we have a lot of exciting ideas and, you know, maybe there's something cool that, that, that you'll like there too. Well, again, thank you so much for um, you know taking the time to speak with us, to give us some you know background of, about yourself as well as Timecrest and the world and the things that you're up to. And we really appreciate the effort not only you know you've put into making Timecrest accessible, but you know it sounds like your community at large of you know really keeping everybody involved and, and connected to the game, um, no matter uh, their you know, physical limitation there. So I really appreciate the effort that you've put in and the, and the community you've built along the way. Thank you so much. And uh, I really am honored to be on. I really appreciate being a part of this. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, I think that this content that you have created is an incredibly valuable resource. And, you know, I, I uh, hope more and more people experience it. I think it's excellent. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you.